You know that site analysis is important. So you go to the site with your friends, you bring your laptop, your sketchbook, you're ready to do some site analysis. You get there, now what? You stand around and chat for an hour and you go home with a simple observation of the site. When you get home, you just get on Google Maps, you overlay the sun path, maybe you take a guess at which way the wind was coming from and you call it a day. That's how site analysis is done for a lot of us. It might seem like a really pointless activity to do at the start of every project, but as I've just discovered from my Studio 7 project, I realized that it really is not just helpful to do, but it's essential in building up the first couple of steps to making a great sketch design and great project. If you complete a site analysis just to tick off the boxes, you're really setting yourself up for failure. I'm going to show you how to do a complete site analysis to form the foundation of your architecture projects. As mentioned, I've just completed the site analysis for my Studio 7 project, and this was actually a part of the assessment. We had to do a site analysis for the first assessment. And I think the way they structured this was really, really well. It was structured in a linear fashion so that it really gave us a step-by-step -step method for starting any architecture project that can be replicated for any project. So let's move into step one. The first step to starting any architecture project is to find the limitations to the site. For example, the sun sets from one side to the other, and that's something you can't change, but it's something you're going to have to learn to work around or use to your advantage, which is a really important point. Because once you find all of the limitations and the constraints of your site, that's when you can start to build up your initial site ideas and design intentions from those limitations. For example, now that you know that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, and you need to shade the northern side appropriately so that it doesn't let in all this heat during summer but it still allows in heat in winter well you now have a strategy for your design or at least one strategy for your design which is to face your building north and shade it from the sun this will help you come up with some initial ideas as to how your building is going to look like what's it um, going to function like what are some of the main objectives that you want to focus on with your design i initially did some computer-based homework before we did our first site visit to find out you know what's the climate like what is the sun path what is the wind direction and what are some of the surrounding buildings what are some of the adjacent programs next to our site for example we've got a big green reserve that runs behind it that's going to be a huge aspect into helping us design our site because now we know that we can utilize that green space to the back which has had something like seven million dollars spent on it in the last 10 years knowing the wind direction that's going to help you decide which way you want to orient your building, orientate your building. So that was the first step, doing my homework on the site before my initial site visit to find out some of those things that you can't change. What are some of the limitations? What are some of the constraints? And this isn't the end of that process. The site analysis process then goes on into your first site visit, which I really want to say something important about it. Quite often in my first few years of architecture school, we'd go on site visits and I would get nothing out of it. As I mentioned at the start of this video, I'd stand around, talk to some friends and then do all my homework from home and really get nothing out of that site visit. But for this project, I decided to take a different approach. I created a checklist of the things that I wanted to look at and document from the site so that when I got there, I wasn't just clueless as to what I'm doing. I decided to have a look at, you know, what are some of the surrounding programs? I'm going to take photos of the surrounding programs. And th that's the key, bring a camera, take lots of photos. As you can see from my site analysis sheet, that there were townhouses overlooking um, and shadowing from the northeast. And so I took pictures of this and I noticed that the two streets that corner the site were really industrialized and they had a lot of commercial buildings on there. And it wasn't really a child friendly space, which is important because I'm designing an early learning center for children. So having an industrial frontage isn't really going to be helpful or very inviting or welcoming for a bunch of kids that are going to school there. And likewise, I noticed that a lot of the houses were pretty run down opposite the site where the entrance currently is and so I figured maybe I don't want to put my entrance on that side in fact we've got this whole green reserve on the back side perhaps we can do something with that and we will get into that soon and so I went to the initial site visit with a full list of things that I wanted to consider and take photos of and then 
I took photos of all that and I had a checklist to go through and I crossed it off after I got each one. What are some of the heritage buildings around there? What's the parking like? And I got all this information, although it might not seem relevant at the start, you can never get enough information from your initial site visit. And I, it's always key to go on multiple site visits across your project. Another thing I did was that the street that my site was on is I went by each house and each um, building that was on that street and took a photo. And then I collated that all together into a panoramic view of the street so that I could look at the street frontages and kind of find different styles, different characteristics of the buildings already there so that it can also help inform my design decisions. So that's step one. Before you get on site, do your site analysis from home, F find out the things that you can from home and then create a checklist of things that you want to look at once you get on site. All of the constraints, all of the things that are going to limit your design, things that you can't change but are going to be there and influence the way that you design your building. Note all those things, take photos of those things and that's really going to help you move into the next step. Step two, which is to create design ideas from these limitations. We call these site moves. For example, I was talking earlier about the sun path going across the site. So I knew that we had this huge northern frontage to the site. There was a whole green reserve behind it, no buildings, nothing blocking it. So I wanted to make the most of the sun path and the direct sunlight we can gain during winter and that we can block out during summer, the daylighting, all of these benefits of following the sun path with the building. And from this limitation of the sun path, which we can't change, which is there no matter what we do, I utilize that constraint as a design strategy, which is this step, your site moves. What are some of the strategies that come out of your site limitations? That's why this initial site analysis that we did was so important because then you figure out these things that are, hmm, maybe that can influence my design. Maybe that can be an initial idea for me. And so I mapped out this idea and just sketched out, you know, my building's going to follow the winter sun path. It's a pretty basic idea, but then from that, I came up with this idea of a circular kind of design where the western side is open so that it doesn't get all this harsh western sunlight. And then you can have a green space in the middle, which then allows supervision of that middle bit from the outside building. That northern bit also has great views out to the park. So then from this initial idea of just following the sun path with my building, it's just bridged off of that and I've developed all these different ideas that come from that. If this is a bit confusing, if we move on to the next one, it might make a bit more sense. This is a really simple site move that I did. From the site analysis, I discovered that the two streets cornering the site weren't very appealing. There, was, there were houses on there that were just run down, broken down. There were other buildings on there that were all domesticated. There was all this vacant land and it wasn't very inviting for children. So I discovered maybe I don't want that to be the entrance, as I said earlier. Maybe if we rotated the site 180 degrees and we put the entrance towards the reserve to the back that has had all this work done on it, that is a green space that is livable and a lot of people use it on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, that's a site move we can do that is, you know, possible. So from this site analysis, we discovered that that's not a place that we want to utilize. So if we make this site move, then we can avoid those limitations or make those limitations influence our design idea, which is to do a 180 spin for the entrance towards the reserve on the north side and then have staff entrance on that uh, industrial side because the staff aren't going to mind it too much. Whereas you want all the kids coming in from the green space that they're happy, ready for the day and not going into the, some building that looks like a jail. So that was step two of the assessment. You start with the analysis, find those limitations and constraints, then you move on into making those constraints, I guess, influence your initial design ideas. Step three was to create a program diagram. When you start a project, you're often given a brief or you create a brief for a client if you're working in the real world. And a brief is just a document explaining kind of all the wants and needs of the client. What are the aspirations for the site? And in that document, it often says you need a kitchen, you need bathroom, you need this, you know, what are the actual spaces that are required of this site? So for me, there was an early learning center, adult learning space, and then obviously um, you need a kitchen, bathroom, all that kind of stuff as well. So then 
For this program diagram, you're trying to figure out how they spatially connect to each other. What needs to be connected to each other in order to satisfy the brief and the program requirements. For example, our kitchen has to be right next to the lunchroom. Otherwise, you don't want the lunchroom to be you know, a kilometer away from the kitchen because that doesn't really make sense. We need the bathrooms to be in between the outdoor spaces and also in between the toddler classrooms so that if toddlers are out playing and they need to go to the toilet, most of the time they can't control themselves. So they need to be able to go into the bathroom easily without having to run through the entire site. But then they also need to be able to access those toilets from the classrooms. So that's why it needs to be between them. So step three is then diagramming this. And this might just be a simple mind map, a bubble diagram. And the feedback I got on this is that that's probably the best way to go. Just the simple diagram, which the next step for that would be to put it over the site so that you know the size of different things and how they connect on the site. And that's something I'm going to do next um, from the feedback I got. And this is something that will be influenced by your initial site analysis that gives you all the information you need to know to be able to then spatially recognize what needs to be connected to each other. And what I've also done is considered what needs visual connection? For example, I want the kids to be able to look out into some of the adult, adult learning spaces so that they can see what they're doing and learn from that. And so I've done just a little orange arrow to show that that is um, a visual connection that needs to be made. And then what about some of the things that need to be separated via sound? Like, for example, if you've got a meeting room, you don't want a meeting room to be right next to a bunch of kids yelling and screaming. So obviously the meeting room has to be sound separated from the kids screaming. So for my assignment, I actually then, yeah, started to put that onto the site, um, but I should have done this in a plan form because the the masses I've shown here aren't actually representative of the heights or the form of my buildings. It's kind of just a spatial diagram. So I didn't need to do an axonometric. So that was the feedback I got. If you're going to do, if you're going to show your programs, show them over the lapping the site, and that's really going to help you. So this is step four. Hopefully you've followed along with everything we've gone through so far. If not, don't worry. We're going to go over it again at the end and we'll summarize it for you. I'll speak a bit slower for that so that um, you can follow along with it again. So step four is finding precedents. And what precedents are, are ideas that have already been built that are similar to what you're doing. So for me, I'm looking at early learning centers because I'm designing an early le learning center. Whenever I did a precedent study, I would never really consider how it affects my design. I would look at the materials. I would look at the, the form of the building. I'd be like, that's cool. I could implement that into my design. And that's the first step. It's recognizing what you can take away from these precedents, from these buildings that are already built, that are doing stuff successfully, and how you can implement that in your own design kind of take parts of different projects that have been done and then squish it all into your project and the best way to go about this is to find those things but then draw them out yourself consider how they are actually going to create the mass of your building how they're going to spatially organize your building how do they imp how do you implement these things into your site so rather than just taking photos of these things and putting it on a page as an inspiration wall you're taking the ideas, but then going one step further and figuring out how do these actually implement, how do, can you implement these into your design? How do they influence your design? What are some of those small key things that you can take away from it and use in your own projects? So for me, what I took away from these early learning centers is that one of them had multiple paths to get to the same spot. And I thought, why would they do that? And it was this idea of giving kids multiple choices to get to his place so that they can experiment and take in different ways. You know, maybe there's a ramp, maybe there's stairs, maybe there's a rope wall you can climb, but there's different opportunities to explore different ways to do things. And I think that's a, you know, a big thing for early learning uh, centers to give kids the opportunity to choose things for themselves. So I like that and I drew it up about how I could implement this into my design of Jew something just really simple. This is nothing amazing, nothing artistic. It's just a sketch that represents my ideas so that I can utilize that in my sketch design. And another thing was these little windows that give you opportunities to look out um, onto other spaces that kids can use. And so I've just drawn a simple wall with little holes in it that looks out into the outdoor area that is going to be below 
um, where the adult learning is so that the kids can peek down and look at what all the adults are doing so that they can learn from it. So it's just these little things that you take away from these already built projects so that you can come up with a library of inspiration that you can actually use in your project. So I know that was a lot to go through. I'm going to now run through a summary of what I've just talked about for the last 20 minutes. And hopefully that gives you a really good grasping and understanding of how to do a site analysis. So step one, again, was doing that initial site analysis of finding what are some of the constraints and limitations of the site that you cannot change that influence your design. What is the sun path? What is the wind direction? What are some of the surrounding buildings doing? Are they overshadowing? Which then leads on into the next bit, which was your site moves. Step two was finding out from these site limitations, from these constraints, what are some of the moves that you can do with them? Can you follow your design along the site's sun path? Can you look at the existing street frontages from your panoramic elevation and then figure out a roof design for your building from what's existing there? You know, maybe that's a thing that you can do. Step three was then interrogating your brief, finding out what programs there were, and then diagramming these in connection to each other. And this can be really simple, just the mind map showing what spaces are connected to each other. And then uh, eventually, hopefully you can get to the point where you overlay this onto your site and you can start showing the different sizes of the spaces. And they don't have to be, you know, actual masses, they can just be circles, just diagramming the different programs that are going to be on your site, that are required on your site, or that you think you're going to add to the site. And then step four was the precedent study, but this isn't just inspiration, this isn't just finding an inspiration board that you can go on Pinterest for, this is taking it that one step further, taking different ideas from precedents, and then meshing it all into your project so that you have a good mix of different ideas that are going to help you come up with your initial design ideas. And once you've done those initial four steps, you can probably see that this is going to be so beneficial to starting your project. I mean, you've already started your project, but this is going to be so beneficial to coming up with a great sketch design or great final project. A lot of people just go straight into designing their building on their site, but they haven't taken into consideration anything that has to do with the site. And it's just, this is not what architecture is about. So I hope you found this short course helpful and I'll see you in the next one.